بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبقي النبي من الله all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who adhere to his guidance asking Allah عز وجل to better us in our adherence to his guidance اللهم آمين may Allah عز وجل grant swift victory to the people of Palestine and support those who support them and write us among those who support them. May Allah Azza wa Jal desert those who desert them and never write us among those who deserted them. So changing the narrative, victims of our circumstances or victors of our circumstances. This uh, paradigm shift requires a little bit of rewind. You know, the great uh, Imam Al-Harawi, Rahimahullah, who is a, a great, great scholar in Islamic history, particularly with regards to the science of uh, spiritual purification, spiritual refinement. In his chapter on Muhasaba, Muhasaba means to basically be a little bit self-critical, to be introspective. To, to look within yourself and say, size yourself up honestly, right? He says, and nobody will ever do that. You'll never actually inspect what inside me needs to change until you've already decided that I'm willing to change. You get it? Like, unless you're decided that I'm ready and willing to pay the price that's when you will actually ask, so what's the price? If you're not ready to change, you're decided that you're going to change, you're just going to look for some superficial way to say, everything's where it should be. No big deal. Maybe I need to just, you know, do a little something here extra, a little something there extra. You'll never be able to properly evaluate yourself without the courage to say, whatever I find, I'm going to address it. And the reason I begin with that is because we often speak about in the context of advocacy, in the context of standing up against oppression and, you know, having the courage to speak truthfully, uncomfortable truths to the world, bring them back to conscience, hold them accountable. Maybe we don't speak enough, the rewind, right? About do we have the courage to speak to ourselves uncomfortably, to hold ourselves accountable what really needs to change you? Are you willing to ask yourself, honestly, how can I prove that my faith in Allah is not fragile? You know, because the Quran says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفِ Among humanity are those who worship God on a verge, on edge. They're at the edge of the cliff. They may not know that they're at the edge of the cliff, but they're about to fall off their faith. Among humanity are those who worship Allah on edge. فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اِطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ If something good comes their way, they're reassured by that. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ انْقَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And if some trial, some hardship, some adversity comes their way, they about face. They fall off. They turn around on their faith. And as a result of that, the ayah says they miss out on this world and the next. You see, some people are reassured by their faith regardless of the circumstances because their faith is not fragile. Other people will only have faith when they're in a state of reassurance, when things are easygoing, when things are comfortable. So we want to be the people that are very far from the edge. We are comfortably situated in our faith. We will not easily be pushed over. But sometimes the trials have to come and expose to us. Are we really reassured by God? Are we sort of servants of the blesser? Or are we dependent on the blessing? Are we servants, slaves of the blessing, of the comfort, of the peace, of the security? So these trials are, are treasures of opportunities for us to ask ourselves those questions. Do I ask myself, you know, think of the context of the atrocity happening nowadays. Do I wonder how could this happen? When will this end already? 
does that question sort of harass you? Sure, it can be a passing thought, and shaitan can sort of try to get us off our rockers, but how much does it trouble you? Because at the end of the day, when someone says, how could this happen? Well, hold on. Did Allah Azza wa Jal promise that this wouldn't happen? Did He promise that as soon as you say, La ilaha illallah, you're going to live paradise on earth? No. In fact, Allah promised the opposite would happen. Do you really think, meaning it's definitely not the way it's going to happen. Do you really think you will just enter paradise before there comes to you the likes of what came to people before you? They were afflicted with so much harm and so much distress and so much suffering and they were shaken to their core. Until the messenger and the believers alongside them said, when is the victory of Allah going to come? Right? Ala inna nasr Allahi qareeb. But they remain certain, the messenger and the believers, that the victory of Allah, the promise of Allah, the support of Allah is always near. You know, recalling this ayah for me, it always reminds us, it's crucial to establish that you will never have closure. You will never have clarity. You will never have resilience. Except through the Qur'an, the Qur'anic worldview, the Qur'anic lens. That's the only way you can liberate yourself from feeling this, you know, this victimhood mentality or sort of experience. You know when Allah Azza wa says, هَذَا بَصَائِرُ لِلنَّاسِ وَهُدَى وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمِ يُقِنُونَ This is a means of insight, a means of insight for people. That means you have to be sure that without this, the Qur'an, you're in the dark. How sure of that are you? If you don't see the world through the Qur'anic worldview, the Qur'anic lens, you're trapped. Trapped in seeing the world with your eyes. And that is sort of extremely limiting. This is the description of the faithless. All they know is the shell nature, the outer nature, the superficial nature of this world, not its realities. And it is a guidance, he said, and a mercy, he said, but for people that are certain in it, certain that this is the only way to see. You know, people ask, for example, like, why haven't the people of Gaza been victorious yet? The question is wrong. They have been victorious, haven't they? Have they not been victorious? What victory is there? But to hold firm on the truth until you meet Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we have you know, Surah Al-Buruj, Surah Al-Buruj, Quranic worldview, here we go again. Surah Al-Buruj can be argued to be the story of genocide, about the people of the trench that were persecuted for their religion and they were burned alive for standing firm. Atrocity, tragic. Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرُ That is the truest success. That they held on till they met Allah. He told you, ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرُ you know, as some scholars have said very beautifully, there is a build-up to this, in this short surah, that is the story of genocide, Surah Al-Buruj, there is a build-up that for sure is not unrelated. How does the surah begin? وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ I swear by the skies and the constellations they, they carry, they hold. وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ And I swear by the promised day, the Day of Judgment. What does he have to do with genocide? Everything's related. The scholar said, because it's, you know, it's always what is sworn by in the Qur'an has a, a relationship with what is being sworn about, which is the story of the trenches, what's being sworn about. Allah is swearing by the constellations in the skies and by the Day of Judgment. Why? They said because the stars in the sky at first glance don't make any sense. Right? But after you familiarize yourself with them, you realize, oh man, I can actually figure out north, south, east, west, the pathways through the desert, I can survive. It does make sense. These constellations that Allah decorated the stars with, decorated the skies with of stars. And then also he swore by the day of judgment. Some things will never fully make sense until when? Until the day of judgment. Right? And then he goes on to say, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the build-up, to the people that were victorious for standing firm on their faith even though they were massacred. He says right before that, 
وما نقم منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد. They held nothing against these believers except the fact that they believed in Allah. But who is Allah? Al Aziz, the Almighty. They never wavered in believing that Allah could stop this at any moment. Allah never stopped being in control, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al Aziz. But also Al Hamid. They never stopped believing that Allah is the most praiseworthy. Meaning, whether you praise Him or not, whether you can see the wisdom or not, He is the praiseworthy. And that is why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When things would be going his way, he would say Alhamdulillahi alladhi bin timmu salihat All praise be to Allah by whose hand all favors come to pass. And when things would not be going his way, when the adversity would come, he would say Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal All praise be to Allah in all circumstances. He is praiseworthy in it all. And that is why calling us to be prophetic, to see ourselves as victors in all circumstances, not victims of our circumstances. One of the Salaf, he used to say, That the slaves of the blessings are many. As for the slaves of the blesser, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he blesses in ways that we know and ways we don't know. He's blessing us in what he gives and blessing us in what he, he withholds. His withholding is another form of giving, sometimes a bigger blessing than what we can visibly see ourselves receiving. As for the slaves of the blesser, they are few. May Allah make us of the few. But it's hard. <laughs> It is hard to see through the pain and stay positive, right? It is victory. The Quran is telling me it's victory, but it is hard. And validating the difficulty of it is how I want to choose to inspire you to power through and commit to it. You know, even the angels struggled with the problem of evil. When Allah Azza wa created humanity, what did the angels say? The angel said, yeah, Allah, we don't understand. Like you put on earth these humans who are going to spread corruption on earth. They're going to wreak havoc on earth. They're going to shed blood on earth. That's what they said. And we celebrate your praises day and night. And we keep ourselves pure for you. Like to have a relationship with you, we have to keep ourselves pure. We do that, right? What did Allah Azrul say to them? Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamu. I know what you don't know. Did he explain to them why every last instance of suffering will happen? No. He said, you need to trust that I know what you don't know. For the angels, that was enough. God knows best. Right? For the believer, you got to put in the work so that it's enough. That answer is not enough for everybody. That's the, the bare, honest, raw, uncomfortable truth. Just trust God. It takes work. Even the messengers struggled with the problem of evil. Right or wrong? Who am I talking about? Musa alayhi salam. We all know the story of Musa alayhi salam. When he, like, like, let's imagine we don't know how the story is going to unfold. Okay, guys? We're getting on the boat with Musa alayhi salam. <laughs> right? Because Allah told him, follow this man al-Khadir. This is a servant of ours. Yes. So this is a servant of ours that we have granted special mercy <laughs> and special knowledge, exclusive knowledge. He gets on the boat and he sees anything but mercy and knowledge, right? Gets on the boat like you too. Like if you didn't know how the story was going to unfold, that is the point. Musa alayhi salam did not know till after what the wisdoms were. He, he punctures the boat. What are you doing? You're going to drown these people. Like, oh, man, this guy is so ungrateful. They gave us a free ride and we punctured their boat and they're like poor seamen trying to like just make ends meet, put two and two together. It's appalling. You wouldn't be able to stay tight. Then you get off the boat, you get on the land. You, you kill someone. Are you out of your mind, man? This is an innocent life. This is how, how can you sort of tolerate, let alone, uh, you know, administer uh, the, the execution of a child? How, how could this be? 
<laughs> and then you go there and then the, the, the people are ungrateful or the people are sort of not hospitable. You get to the town and then you find these two young orphans and then you sort of build out the wall for them. And then Musa alayhi doesn't even object. He just says like, man, they wouldn't treat us nice. At least they payment for it. Right? Makes sense. Makes sense. And then Al-Khadir, as you know, explains to him the greater good involved in the wisdom behind for which Allah told him to do what he did. The scholar said what? Uh, the great Mauritani scholar, Sheikh Dadu, I'm not sure if this was sort of his own uh, reflection on the verses, uh, or he found this in the works of other scholars, but it's truly profound. He said what's amazing about the story of Musa alayhi salam is that these three incidents he had to go through of apparent evil should have been, they're by design, they're not random, they should have been the easiest of them for Musa alayhi salam to notice. So you get on the boat and you're causing the boat to sink. But Allah told you, trust this guy, trust Al Khadir. You should have noticed why? Because you, O oh Musa, were placed in a basket and you were supposed to sink and you didn't. You didn't drown. And then you move on and sort of this young child is killed, but it's not what it seems. You should have caught it, O Musa, because you also were turned into a fugitive and ran out of Egypt because you murdered a man, supposedly, allegedly, but it actually wasn't as it seemed. And then you get to the town and you erect the wall for these two orphans and you don't take payment for it. You should have, shouldn't have objected. Because when you got to Median, O Musa, you saw those two girls, those two women at the well, and you got them their water, you helped them out, and you did not accept payment. You walked off to the tree and just sat down and made dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Isn't that amazing? The parallels there? Even the messengers, right? But these stories, by the way, are there in the Qur'an so that through these deep illustrations, the Qur'an in its great wisdom, Allah doesn't just say, trust God. He gives you reason after reason to bolster your trust in God so that now you can apply it to the scenarios where the Qur'an didn't talk about. The applications like Gaza today, for instance. But if you drift from the Qur'an, you drown. You drown in darkness, in loss of perspective. You know, how much time do I have left? Because I know I'm... Thumbs up. You're good. You guys are not going anywhere. You guys don't do this five prayers thing. Sound like Maghrib coming. Okay. I'm the traveler, not you guys. So, you know the notion of dhikr. You know the, the late uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Ghazali, rahimahullah, he has a very profound line that I always recall about the notion of dhikr. Like, why is the Qur'an called a dhikr? More than anything else, it's called a reminder. Because we actually need to be reminded, perhaps even more so than to be taught. Like, we are hardwired for forgetfulness, for heedful, heedlessness. And it takes work to stay awake. So he says, rahimahullah, he says, we must always remember that when we are performing dhikr, not just subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, all of that, yes, we're taught to repeat these words for a reason, so they can echo in our hearts eventually. But the greatest dhikr, the Qur'an, right? Any form of dhikr. He says the point of dhikr, these words of remembrance, are not for you to remember some distant reality. It's not like the God is a theoretical, abstract, distant, you know, or imaginary, a'udhu billah, like being that you're trying to like, mind over matter, mind over matter, God's going to make, no. The point of dhikr is not to remember something absent. It's to bring yourself back from absent-mindedness. You are trying to resuscitate, revive yourself to reality, the ultimate reality, that Allah is in charge and He will make it worth our while and that He knows best, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose of dhikr. But that's our amana. In life, that is our responsibility, to stay awake. And it's not a small amana. You know the, the ayah in the end of Surah Al-Ahzab when Allah Azza wa Jal said, Inna aradna al-amana, we have offered this responsibility to live right, to live faithfully, right? To live committedly to Allah, the mighty and majestic. We offered this responsibility, this amana, this trust to the skies and the earth and the mountains. فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا And they all declined. 
taking it on. We don't want the responsibility. Yes, we get to be with you forever in Jannah, oh Allah, but the risk is too high. I'm not going to do it. They all declined the responsibility. minha, And they were intimidated by it. insan, And took it, and the human being said, I'll take it. So Ibn al-Jawzi, Abu al-Faraj, he has a profound reflection on what this amana is. He says, some people think this responsibility we have in life of faith and righteousness. He, he says, some people think this is a walk in the park. And whoever thinks carrying this amana is easy doesn't understand the nature of taklif, of sort of our religious obligation, our responsibility to Allah, this trust that we are obligated to carry. He said, the people who think it's easy think that this amana, what comes to mind always is like praying two rak'ahs or like, you know, washing two limbs, donating two dollars. He said, that's why you think it's easy. He said, but these are actually the easiest responsibilities of being a Muslim. He says, the hardest responsibility, amana, you have as a Muslim is to see the whole world turn upside down sometimes, whether on an individual, personal level or on a global, whatever. Chaos is happening and you have to force your mind to say, Allah is still Arhamur Rahimin the most merciful of all, more merciful than us. We don't have a shred of mercy inside our hearts except what he placed in our hearts. He goes, that's the hardest part. He said, and that shows you, he says, this is his words, the great disparity between the duties of the limbs, those are the easy responsibilities, he says, and the duty of the intellect, the mind. It's our duty to rebuild and refine our intellects with revelation so that we can be victors, not victims. That's our job. The final point I want to share here, because I am uh, running out of time. Uh, is that Gaza is an opportunity, for sure. An opportunity for you to say, how do I see this? Do I see this as totally unfair? In the cosmic sense, of course, we're going to push back against it. We're going to fight Qadar with Qadar, right? If it's in our destiny to improve the situation, we're going to try, right? But ultimately, the aspect of this, the dimension that's outside of our hands, are we going to say that, like, what, these, the, the tyrant is operating out of Allah's hands? No, he's not operating outside of Allah's hands. He's ultimately in control. At the end of the day, those lives we fail to save are lives that he sent angels down with those children's names to go say, bring them back to me. They're handpicked, if you will, if I can use that term very loosely. The same way you pick roses from a garden, right? These are the roses that Allah picked. That's, that, that takes work. And Gaza will not be our last test to see the world like this and not fall off of our faith in the sort of storms of adversity. We may go through a tougher test in our personal lives. And the condition of the world may pose humongous trials moving forward. In fact, it's only a matter of time. And I want to close with that. We must level up because things will not get easier. But we might get stronger. Stronger like the people of Gaza. Faith does that. It makes you unbreakable. You know, subhanAllah, uh, if you've been uh, in the masjid long enough, <laughs> you'll hear the shaykh mention stories about the sort of unbelievable faith of the early Muslims and the almost supernatural feats early Muslims were able to perform by virtue of their faith. And a lot of times the shuyukh are met with sort of like a, a stares of, of skepticism. Like, what do you mean, Urwa ibn Zubair said, wait till I'm praying, then amputate my leg, right? Right? This is an authentic incident, undeniable, right? What do you mean, Abbad ibn Bishr, radiallahu anhu al-jami'ah, continued praying after being shot with arrow after arrow after arrow? We almost lost faith in faith. We, it's hard for us to believe that stuff is possible. And then Allah brings us the people of Gaza, and we're watching these videos that we think are just like, it is not just the non-Muslims being amazed by this and turning to Islam. 11-year-old kid without anesthetic reciting Quran as they're performing surgery on him while he's wide awake. How does that even work? A man seeing his son slaughtered in front of him. And he's, he's bolstering everyone else. Tell them, keep it together. Allah honored them. Hopefully we get the same honor. Inna lillah. We belong to Allah. Wa inna ilayhi raji'un. It's inevitable. We all go back to, where do you, like, is this real? Is this human? We just see it in front of us now. 
That's what's available to every last one of you to the degree and in proportion to our nearness to the Quran because it will get harder. You know, when the Prophet wasallam spoke about the end of times, he said, the earth will be filled with justice and equity after it has been filled to the brim. So it's got to fill. After it's been filled to the brim with oppression and tyranny. And he said, trials will come at the end of time. Every time a trial comes, it will make you feel the previous trial was a walk in the park. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayati ala nasi zaman, a time will come over the people. The people will be filtered. They will be sifted through. Like, you know, you put flour through like a strainer and you, you filter out what shouldn't be there. That's the purpose of the trials. People will be filtered through. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the fourth hadith, and I'll close with it. Until people become one of two classes. فُسْطَاتُ إِمَانٍ لَا نِفَاقَفِي There will be a camp of faith, no blemish of hypocrisy, no doubts in their faith, solid in their convictions. إِمَان no نِفَاق وَفُسْطَاتُ نِفَاقٍ لَا إِمَانَ فِي And a camp of hypocrisy, doubts, where there is no faith. He said, فَإِذَا كَانَ ذَاكُمْ أَوْ ذَلِكُمْ Once that happens, فَانْتَظِرُ الدَّجَّالَ مِنْ يَوْمِهِ أَوْ غَدِهِ Then await the greatest trial of all, which is a Dajjal, the false Messiah, on that very day or the next day max. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fortify us with our faith and allow us to hold firm to his book, the Qur'an, the fountain of faith. May Allah azza wa jal grant victory to the people of Gaza and grant us their faith. May Allah grant us the trust in him that allows us to be unwavering, that we are in fact victors so long as we believe in him. And so long as we abide by the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah help us discontinue our foot dragging wherever we may be foot dragging. And allow us the stamina to perform that spiritual labor that will give us a brand new relationship with him like never before. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallah khairan.